in this session, we're very fortunate to have Abby Patel. Abby is a consultant colorectal surgeon at the University Hospitals of Coventry and Warwickshire NHS Trust, and she has a specialist interest in robotic and laparoscopic uh, surgery for inflammatory bowel disease and intestinal failure. Uh, Abby qualified from Cambridge University in 2005, completed her postgraduate surgical training in the West Midlands, and has undertaken fellowships in Oxford and Toronto. Um, Abby has been involved in setting up the MidOx network, which brings together clinicians interested in managing inflammatory bowel disease across the Midlands and Oxford regions. She's very passionate about improving outcomes for patients with inflammatory bowel disease through developing training pathways, uh, undertaking um, clinical research, and collaborating across hospitals to deliver services. And Abby is going to tell us um, about the management of pouchitis. Um, thank you, um, and um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, this is my first IA national event. Um, I've attended a few of the Coventry meetings, so I'm really pleased to be here uh, and to be in front of you all uh, and have some opportunity to talk to everybody. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about pouchitis. Um, to be honest, I wasn't really sure at what level to pitch this, so if it becomes too sort of scientific, I'll try and keep it a bit more patient-centric as we go along. So a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. So what is pouchitis? Who gets it? Um, why do they get it? How is it found and how is it diagnosed? What can I do about it? And will it get better? Um, and I thought before we sort of delve into the nitty gritty of, of how we do all of those things, um, I'll just talk a little bit about the different bits of a pouch. So the bit of bowel that goes into the pouch, um, which is the sort of the straight bit of a J, is the afferent limb. As it goes round and you get the tail, that's the efferent limb. Um, where it joins onto the little last bit of um, the anal canal um, is the pouch anal anastomosis. And just above it, there's a little bit of bowel that's left from when we do uh, the operation to remove the large bowel, which is called the cuff. And, uh, and this will become more relevant as we go through the talk. So normal pouch function. What is normal pouch function? Um, I don't think that's a very easy question to answer. Um, generally speaking, in the first sort of 12 months, we all accept that it will be very unpredictable. You'll have some frequency, some urgency, possibly some episodes of incontinence. You'll struggle to tell the difference between gas and stool. So there'll be a lot of, of trying to learn how to, to tell the difference between those two things. Um, and that process of adaptation where your body gets used to having a pouch and the pouch expands, so it starts working a bit more like your back passage used to, uh, will take time. And then over that period of time, as that function normalizes, what is quoted as being good function is opening your bowels five to seven times a day in a large proportion of patients waking up at night at least once, and some of them will still have urgency. Now, that is somebody with a good pouch function. Somebody with a poor pouch function will swing to the, to the other side and go more frequently, and you'll have some patients who open their bowels much less frequently than that uh, and don't wake up at night. So some people will have really, really good function. And what's then generally accepted is that over a period of time, for possibly reasons we don't completely understand, your pouch function deteriorates. Um, and there is a failure rate um, over a period of time, and people's pouches will stop working, and they'll start misbehaving. Um, and the quoted uh, rate of that failure is about 10% at 10 years, but it varies considerably from one unit to another and with the experience level of the person who's making the pouch. So that's also known. So what is pouchitis? So pouchitis refer is a sort of an umbrella term that is branded for any inflammation in the ileal pouch. Um, and it's characterized by going to the toilet more than you used to, having abdominal pain with it, and, and having cramps, occasionally passing mucus and blood and sometimes even feeling more poorly than that with having a temperature, losing weight. So some of the symptoms that you would have had if you'd had ulcerative colitis almost seem to be coming back. 
who gets it? So there's a considerable variation in patients who have a pouch and have ulcerative colitis and those who have something called FAP, which is the most sort of other common reason for having a pouch. Uh, and FAP is a genetic condition where patients get polyps and cancer and we have to remove their entire large bowel and make a pouch. So in patients with ulcerative colitis, the rate is quoted as being up to 50%. So in that, and that's in the lifetime of having a pouch and any episode of pouchitis. In FAP, it's quoted between zero and 10. So it's much less frequent in those who have FAP. Um, generally speaking, there are certain things in your background leading up to when you had the pouch that will put you at higher risk. So somebody who's got extensive ulcerative colitis, somebody who's got primary sclerosing cholangitis, and something called backwash ileitis. Backwash ileitis is basically if you have ulcerative colitis, the bowel that's usually inflamed is your large bowel. If, when we do your camera test and we go all the way around, we usually go into your small bowel and have a look at the small bowel. And it's that last bit of the small bowel in a proportion of patients will be still inflamed. So those patients that have got backwash ileitis. It's not like Crohn's where the small bowel's got inflamed. It's uh, related to having the ulcerative colitis. But what we know is if we then take that bit of small bowel and make your pouch, you are at higher risk of having pouchitis in the future. So that's also a risk factor. Um, and then not smoking, uh, a bit like when um, not smoking is a risk factor for ulcerative colitis. And then other conditions that make you have more immune uh, dysregulation. So if you have something called P-ANCA antibodies, which is commonly associated with some of the rheumatoid arthritis uh, and using uh, non-steroidals. Why do you get it is probably even more difficult a question to answer. Um, and there's lots and lots of different theories that are branded around. And I'd say that generally speaking, we know that it happens because there's something that goes wrong in the pouch and your body reacts to it in a different way to somebody who doesn't have a pouch, but also who some, somebody who doesn't have ulcerative colitis. And that goes back to the beginning bit where the incidence of the pouchitis varies very much on whether you have it for ulcerative colitis or whether you have it for FAP. So some people believe that pouchitis is like your ulcerative colitis coming back. And it's the same sort of pathology that's happening uh, in the pouch. And if you look at patients who have pouches and we take little samples and biopsies of them and we look at them under the microscope, we find that the small bowel has gone through some changes. So your small bowel, a bit like the diagrams that Gordon showed, has a lot of folds on it called villi, which are like little fingers. In normal patients, when you do a um, small bowel biopsy, you'll see those little villi and you'll see those fingers. In a patient who's got a pouch, if you take biopsies, those villi have all gone, they've disappeared. Uh, and they get a certain thing on microscopy called crypts, which are again a different type of fold that are usually found in large bowel. You suddenly start finding it in the small bowel pouch. So that process is termed colonic metaplasia, which is a posh way of saying that the bowel that you used in the small bowel for a pouch has turned a little bit like the large bowel and is looking more and more like the large bowel. And as it goes through that process, it often attracts inflammatory cells and that then predisposes you to inflammation. That process seems to be more profound in patients who've got ulcerative colitis than FAP. So there may be something underpinning that. Bacterial dysbiosis, so there's a lot of literature out there and lots of reports on how the microbiome um, and the bacteria that are sitting in your pouch vary based on whether you have FAP or ulcerative colitis. And what that does is it upsets the balance. So there are certain bacteria that use oxygen to, to work and there are certain bacteria that use other sources. And what we know in patients who have pouchitis is that the bacteria that use oxygen go up and the bacteria that use sulfate go up. And based on the chemical sort of imbalance, you then get more uh, injury to the lining of the bowel and you get uh, inflammation. And then the other thing that's important to mention is short-chain fatty acids. 
because um, there are enemas that you can get which have short chain fatty acids and these are fatty acids that are very healthy for your bowel and yet the lining of your bowel relies upon them to work so there have been some studies where they've looked at putting enema, enemas with short chain fatty acids into patients who've got pouchitis but they found some mixed results and that's probably because it's not one thing that's going wrong it's actually multifactorial and it's all sort of interrelating and then the other interesting thing is that the genetic predisposition. So there have been some studies looking at different ethnic groups. And what, what some of them have found is patients from the South Asian population who have a pouch are at much higher risk of having pouchitis than their non-South Asian counterparts. Um, so there is something in uh, the genetic makeup of the individual. Uh, and again, there are certain genes that have been identified that link up with a higher risk of pouchitis. How is it picked up or identified, or how are you told that you have pouchitis? Um, it's based on three things, really. Based on what you tell us, so how your symptoms have changed, and how your going to the toilet has changed. Um, it's based on looking inside the pouch and, and proving that there's inflammation there. Uh, and thirdly, on taking tissue samples and looking at them under the microscope. And, and this is the pouch, uh, pouchitis disease activity index. It's a posh way of saying that it's a little mark sheet and it gives you a score. Uh, and if you score more than seven, you have pouchitis. If you take away the biopsy results, uh, if you have more than five, you have pouchitis. It's an objective way of us putting patients into categories so that if we're going to look and see whether drugs and medications work, we can categorize people better. So how is it classified? And this is a very pragmatic and sort of clinical way of, of, of looking at it. Is, is it acute or is it chronic? So an acute episode of pouchitis will get better within four weeks. If it lasts beyond four weeks, then we term it chronic. Is it continuous or is it relapsing? So is it there all the time and you're suffering with the symptoms all the time? Or is it coming and going in waves? Uh, and if it's coming and going in waves, we term it relapsing, remitting. And then how does it respond to antibiotics? So does it get better if you give antibiotics, which is it's antibiotic responsive? Then if you stop the antibiotics, does it come back? Then it's become antibiotic dependent. And is it something where you give lots of antibiotics, it makes no difference, and it's antibiotic refra refractory? Uh, and there are some of the terms that are branded around. Generally speaking, if you have one episode of pouchitis in about 40% of patients, it will go away and it won't come back. In 60%, it will become a recurrent feature. What we don't know is how what the interval is going to be between you having one episode and the, and the next one. And in a very small proportion of patients, in about 5 to 10%, it becomes chronic and doesn't go away. And that's chronic refractory pouchitis, where some of the other treatments that I'll go on to mention are become more important. So ignore all the figures in there. Essentially, for acute pouchitis, the best treatment is to have ciprofloxacin, um, and second line is metronidazole. This is basically is showing um, essentially that the number of patients that we're basing this on is actually very small. Um, so th the study that this is sort of quoted from has only really got nine patients in it. So the evidence base or the research in this area isn't very good uh, and our understanding is fairly primitive. If you have chronic pouchitis, then the, the, the thing that has the most evidence is VSL3. And I'm sure most of you in the audience will have heard of it. Some of you will have tried it. Um, there is pretty good evidence for it, but again, on very small numbers. So the patients that are in these studies are small groups of patients because they, of the nature of the study, but it does help. So VSL3, basically, they looked at it over 12 months, and once you have your antibiotics and you, you've got rid of the acute bout of pouchitis, you then go on to VSL3 to sort of stop yourself from getting pouchitis in the future. And, and in that sort of a scenario, the risk of having pouchitis drops quite markedly. It's also been used in patients where when the stoma is reversed and the pouch becomes functional, they gave it over 12 months. And they found again that in a prophylactic way, in a way to try and stop yourself getting pouchitis in those first 12 months, it was very effective at doing that. So VSL3 is, is very good. The problem with it is access 
and, and the fact that it's very expensive. Uh, and that often limits how widely it's used. So how do you treat it in terms, what, what do you do when the antibiotics don't work or in patients where the antibiotics work but they can't take them for so long or you, you, you find that they, they just, you, you can't tolerate it. So there are lots of other treatments that we can offer um, to help with the pouchitis symptoms. And those are some of the ones that I've, I've listed. Some of them are topical, which means that they come in, a, in an enema form. Uh, and if things get really bad and, and the topical things aren't working, then we start moving on to more aggressive treatments such as tablets or infusions. Pretty similar sort of way like you would do for ulcerative colitis. So this is the newest study that I could find, which actually shows that vidalizumab um, is effective at reducing um, a chronic pouchitis in patients. Um, and it's the only trial that's ever been done uh, at this scale for pouchitis um, across 100 patients. Um, they gave them ciprofloxacin for the first few weeks to get rid of the acute bout of pouchitis and then gave vidalizumab at regular intervals and showed that in patients where the pouchitis was pretty severe, the risk of having it at uh, 14 weeks and at 34 weeks, so at sort of six, six month mark, um, it, it reduced it significantly. So it, vidalizumab is probably the one that's got the most evidence in terms of the biologic agents. But there's a little question and a little caution here. It's not that simple. And the reason I say that it's not that simple is that there's many reasons why the pouch is misbehaving and not behaving like it should. And many of the other reasons improve with antibiotics. Um, and many patients fulfill the criteria for pouchitis, but you have poor function because of something else. So these are some of the other reasons why pouches won't behave like they're supposed to. Um, and I think we have to be mindful. A lot of the time we say it's pouchitis, but actually true pouchitis, where you don't find another reason for it, only really affects 30% of people with pouches. So the vast majority of patients who come in and, and we say you've got pouchitis often have other reasons why the pouch isn't working. And some of these are infections. So it's very important that we look for those infections because they also will be treated with antibiotics. But the, the, the problem may not happen once you clear that infection. There can be something called ischemia. So when we make the pouch um, surgically, we have to be very careful that the blood vessels all going down to the bit of pouch are all very healthy. And sometimes, because of the bowel being stretched in a certain way, the blood supply is disrupted. And it's disrupted, the bowel isn't as healthy because the blood going to it isn't, isn't um, making it as healthy. So they, they get, you can get ischemia as a cause for having a poor pouch. Some of the other things are Crohn's, something that some people will fear if the pouch stops working or they develop a fistula uh, around the pouch. Is it, is it Crohn's? Is it, it's not ulcerative colitis anymore. Um, and, and that is something that is quite difficult to tell because when you look at it, it looks the same as somebody with pouchitis and ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. Um, and when you do the biopsies, you don't often find the changes you normally find in Crohn's. So it can be quite difficult to tell whether it's actually you've got Crohn's now in your pouch rather than it's the pouch um, in itself. Uh, and then lastly, something called irritable pouch. So it's, it's where your pouch doesn't do what it's supposed to do and you score um, on all of the clinical things on that uh, activity index but actually when you look inside the pouch it looks completely normal uh, and that's similar to having sort of irritable bowel syndrome and some of the treatments that are used for irritable bowel syndrome would also be useful in that setting. So how do you work out what's going on and how can we make sure that there isn't anything else that's causing the pouch to behave, uh, misbehave? Um, so like I said, only 30% of um, people who have pouchitis have what we call true idiopathic pouchitis. So in 70%, it's important that we look for another cause. So the main thing is, how do you work out what is going on? It's talking and, and, and working out whether the pouch behaved uh, badly at the beginning and, and has always behaved like that, or whether it's suddenly started to misbehave. Um, is it definitely ulcerative colitis? 
um, on the first bit of um, operations where we've taken your bowel away, is that definitely ulcerative colitis? Or were, was there any suspicion that there could be Crohn's there? Um, examining, um, uh, looking specifically at that join between where the pouch is and the last bit of your back passage, has that narrowed down? Because that can also happen over time. Um, and then making sure there's no infection. So we, you know, we ask for a stool culture uh, and looking inside the pouch and make sure that there's nothing else that's going on. So the common things are, it's an, a bout of acute pouchitis, in which case you would get antibiotics. If it's a narrowing at that specific uh, area where we've made the join, then that's relatively easy to, to work out at the beginning. Um, we would put you to sleep and then dilate it so that it allows the pouch to open up and empty more easier. Um, and then there's something specific which will get, sometimes get mentioned as something called cuffitis. So that's the bit where I mentioned at the beginning, um, between the pouch and the, the join, there's a little rim of, of bowel um, that's left behind from when we've done the original operation, and that's called the rectal cuff. That's usually a couple of centimetres. That can also get inflamed, and that is very similar to you having a flare-up of uh, ulcerative colitis. And again, we'll respond to some of the topical treatments for people who've had proctitis in the past. So you get topical steroids or misalazine. And then we want to do a detailed assessment. And we only do a detailed assessment if, after all of the simple treatments, they fail and the pouch does not behave like it should do. And you continue to have symptoms that are disruptive and affecting your quality of life. And it's a little bit like Jack in the Box that isn't working. So if it's not working, why is it not working? And so you want to look inside the box, you want to look at the top of the box, at the bottom of the box, around the box, and how the mechanism of that box works. So you would look at um, all of those things through a load of different tests. So it may be that you, you go along and you say, I've, it's not working, my antibiotics haven't worked, and, and things are progressing. You will then be put through a more systematic sort of assessment to make sure there isn't anything else that we can reverse that will help the pouch to function. And those are some of the tests that you will go through, which I'll, I won't go through in very much detail, but essentially it, looking inside the pouch and putting a camera in and having a look is very, very important because it helps you to identify some of the subtle differences between the things that can go wrong. So if the entire pouch is inflamed, then it may be pouchitis, but you may get just specific areas where the pouch is inflamed and little patches that might suggests that there's some form of ischemia or problem with the blood supply rather than it just being an inflammation of the pouch. Um, and then um, if you take biopsies, you will find um, some signs of the, some of these infections, particularly uh, CMV, um, will be found um, when they take biopsies. So it's very important that that first assessment involves looking inside the pouch. Um, we want to look above the pouch. So sometimes the bowel that's going into the pouch narrows down at the top. And that sometimes suggests that you may have Crohn's, or again, it could be to do with how the pouch was made. made. And that is something that can also be treated surgically if needed. So it's important that we make sure that there isn't anything at the top of the pouch that's causing a problem with how things are going into your pouch and, and, and affecting how it works. Um, and then looking outside the pouch. Now, the main thing outside the pouch is an infection. And often these infections can be quite small when you first have your pouch made. And over time, they cause little infection. Every so often, you have the antibiotics, it clears the, the infection, you, you go on for a bit longer, and then it comes back again. Over a period of time, that then causes quite a bit of scarring and, and um, uh, causes the whole uh, pouch to narrow down. And then it doesn't expand like it should do, and you have to go to the toilet more frequently. So it's very important that we rule out infection as being a cause of this. Um, it also helps us to find out whether in the long term giving you lots of antibiotics is really going to help your pouch to improve or whether we need to go in and do something more aggressive to try and get rid of that infection. Um, the bottom of the pouch, so the common things are fistulas, so um, quite often um, it's either the, na the, the joint narrows down or because of infections you have develop a fistula and the infection will find the path of least resistance and will eventually find its way to the surface in the form of a fistula. 
Um, like I said, above the pouch is important to make sure that that bowel at the top of the pouch um, is behaving like it should do. Some patients will develop um, scarring um, and adhesions, and if you develop those, um, it will stop it working and, and filling like it should do. Um, this is basically just to say that um, if there's an infection that we can't get on top of with antibiotics, there is a risk that um, we, we have to divert uh, for a period of time to let that infection settle down. That's why it's important that we go looking for that infection. Um, I've already mentioned, so cuffitis and pouchitis, um, all of those sort of bracket of, of um, diagnoses, you would give um, anti-inflammatory uh, medication or biologics. If you have an infection, we'll give infec uh, uh, antibiotics for specifically for those infections. And then this is a sort of an overview of how we look and, and, and assess pouchitis. So essentially, if it's acute, you have antibiotics. If you respond to the antibiotics, it may become necessary to have antibiotics as and when you have the flares of pouchitis. In some patients, it continues, it doesn't stop, it doesn't go away. Some of those people will then need antibiotics on a more regular basis or continuously. Um, if the pouchitis becomes chronic and lasts beyond four weeks, then we really have to look at other ways of managing it. And that's either recycling antibiotics on a regular basis or we're looking at other treatment options similar to what you find in ulcerative colitis. So steroids, some of the biologic medications um, and um, things like azathioprine or 6-mercaptopurin. So those things become more important. And lastly, just to mention Crohn's, if, you've, if you're suspicious that there's Crohn's uh, in the pouch, then we have to be fairly aggressive with treating it. Um, and it's very important that um, you go on to these more stronger medications quickly to, to have the best chance of saving the pouch. Because if the Crohn's becomes established and there's narrowing or stricturing or you develop fistulas, then it becomes more and more difficult to save the pouch uh, long term. So in, 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 if there's any suspicion, then we want to put you onto a biologic medication fairly quickly. So just to conclude, um, only 30% of poor pouch function is true idiopathic pouchitis. It's very important that we look for all of those other things that I've really quickly glossed over. Um, it's also important that we involve you in all of these decisions um, and have gastroenterology and surgical support. The gastroenterologist will tell us better how to manage you from the medical point of view and the surgeons are important to see if there are anything surgical that we need to do to stop the pouch from misbehaving. Um, and lastly, it's really important that you have realistic goals of, of how the treatment's going to impact um, I see lots of different patients who are at either end of the spectrum uh, and often patients where you talk and you find that they go into the toilet every two hours, they just carry on. Um, and some patients, they, they wake up once at night and that disrupts them so much they can't carry on. So that spectrum is very important and that's why it's very important that we learn from you what is important to you when it comes to pouchitis. So... We're going to end there. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope it was. Thanks, Abby. So I think we, we have a couple of minutes for questions, and Abby, I don't think you're here this afternoon for I'm the roundtable sure. thing, so if you have any questions specifically about pipe charities, now is the time to raise them if you want Abby to answer them. I'm going to ask you one question then, briefly, while people are thinking. In this country, we would not routinely offer a patient with Crohn's disease an alluenal pouch, mm -hmm. but that is not the international experience. No. So in France, for example, they would routinely offer some patients with Crohn's disease an alluenal pouch. Do you want to comment on that? Um, I, I think generally speaking, um, we accept that um, the outcome from patients who've got Crohn's is 
is very variable and, the, and in the instances where it's offered, it's offered under very strict criteria. Um, and I think part of the reason is we lack the experience in, in the UK to be able to do that. Part of it also is I think that we haven't got the numbers in each unit. So we, it, the, the places where patients with Crohn's will be offered a pouch, say, across <coughs> Europe, will be in very high volume, specific, centralised centres. And we just don't have that makeup here, nor the experience sure. to be able to offer it. I think the point is if you, if you found out you have Crohn's disease in a pouch, it's usually in this country not because you were offered a pouch for the treatment of Crohn's disease. No. It's because we thought you had colitis. Yeah. And in a proportion of patients, probably of the order of 8 to 10%, yeah. unfortunately, even looking back, it looks like colitis. But over time, it becomes clear that it wasn't colitis. It was Crohn's. And, of course, that leaves us with a, a proportion of patients with, with pouches Crohn's. with Crohn's who are really quite difficult to look after. internal pouches, so cot pouches, ileoanal pouches. Do you think because of the improvement with biologics, more patients are going down that route than being offered internal pouch surgery? I don't think it's, it's completely to do with that because there are still patients coming for colectomies and requiring colectomies. Um, so if you look at the point at which they're offered a pouch, I think that it varies quite considerably. And, and generally speaking, uh, when I went up to Toronto, it was very interesting to see that as soon as you had your colectomy for acute flare-up, you, within six to eight weeks, you would be seen in a, in a clinic and you would be told um, that you were going to come in at a certain point in a couple of months for your pouch. And it wasn't um, even a question of, of really whether you wanted a pouch or not. It was, you are going to have a pouch. I think that the experience base and, and my sort of UK experience is very much you're offered a pouch. And I increasingly find a lot of patients coming back to clinic in their teens even, as early as their teens, saying, I don't want a pouch. Um, I, I don't want to have any of the complications that happen with a pouch. I just want my rectum out. I want to carry on with my life. Or I just want to be surveyed for a period of time and, and, and go through my 20s. So patients that I think would want a pouch are coming to clinics saying, we don't want a pouch. And I don't really, I, I haven't quite worked out why that is. Um, some of it is media. Some of it is patients with poor experience. You know, that side of it. Some of it is... The widely, I think generally speaking, UK patients accept stomas more. I think our stoma counselling process has improved over time. Um, our ability to live with a stoma has, has improved. So stomas are more accepted, I'd say, in the UK than they say are in some of the other sort of European countries. Um, and that, I think, makes that difference. The other point which I think is interesting is that it's almost impossible to find anybody in this country who has any experience of making cock pouches. Yeah. Except yeah. for Richard Lovegrove. Yeah. I've, I've, done, yeah, under. I've yeah. done one, yeah. and I did it with John Nichols, who some of you will know, yeah. um, who had actually retired, <laughs> but he came to Manchester to yeah. help us do a cock pouch, which unfortunately went wrong, and he had to come back the yeah. two days later to help sort it out. So, you know, it's difficult. Uh, there are very few people with experience of cock pouches. Yeah. There's literally perhaps one or two. There are in only this one country. or two. I mean, I, I, there's well, only one in the whole of Scandinavia, and that's Tom Orisland, and he's yeah. just retired. Yeah. yeah. I've actually had surgery with Tom. When yeah. Tom Orisland. Yeah, Tom yeah. Orisland. And so Lee Hultain. Well, he's retired. Yeah. <laughs> Good. When Prof Nichols retired. retired. So, Abby, thank you very that's much okay. for Thanks a very, very stimulating and exciting <laughs> lecture. Thank you.